Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so um, another chapter in Moorcroft. This is Moorcroft's take on causal loop diagrams. So hopefully a lot of review after what we've gone through uh, so far, but maybe some new insights. Um, so Moorcroft, really this chapter is not just about causal loop diagrams, but like he says, it's kind of a philosophical uh, chapter about event-oriented thinking. And it's a little tricky the way he phrases it because he starts talking in the chapter, talking initially about how attractive event-oriented thinking can be. And he's not meant to be suggesting that event-oriented thinking is a good thing to do. He's suggesting that it's very tempting to do, but it can lead to a lot of problems. So we often want to resist the temptation to take an event-oriented perspective and embrace this feedback systems perspective. So that's kind of uh, the thing there. So it's a little tricky at first because he seems kind of positive about this event-oriented thinking. So what is event-oriented thinking? It's this idea that um, we're out in the world as a decision maker and there is some goal that we'd like to reach. We look at the situation and we might notice a discrepancy. And so that leads us to a decision to hopefully bring the goal, the situation up to the goal, which um, provides us some action and results. And so this really is itself a very simple feedback loop where we're um, looking for um, a difference from where we'd like to be. And then we're making an action to hopefully fix that and fix it once and for all. And then we wait around for the next event. So we wait for problems, we fix those individual problems, and then we wait for more problems. That's kind of this event-oriented worldview. And he gives these examples, and these examples weren't meant to, again, be examples of what he thought were the best solutions for these problems, but just common solutions that come up when people have this perspective in mind. So, um, you know, if you have binge drinkers, maybe put more police on the street. More drug-related crime, again, more police. Congestion, build more roads, et cetera. So these are all very simple kind of one-step thinking where this is kind of an obvious solution to a problem. So a problem arrives from outside the system, you didn't anticipate it, and so then you come up with a solution and wait for the next problem to arise from outside the system, not realizing that there could be feedbacks. And so this is the open loop view, and we use that term because we're assuming that there is that there are no feedbacks. We're assuming that that um, there, there, there might actually be a loop here, but we've broken the loop. And in this perspective, there is no loop. The problem comes from outside the system, not from inside the system. The call is not coming from inside the house, it's from outside. And the solution is a response to that particular problem. And once you've solved it, the problem goes away and you wait for the new problem to come into the system. But this perspective, this open loop perspective, has potential problems because there could be feedbacks from your solution. And so it illustrates this with this little cartoon. This guy is sitting in the middle here. He decides to solve some problem with maybe, you know, wants to see to his left. So he pushes these stones uh, down to solve the problem of not being able to see, not realizing that there's a, a delay which will end up leading to his demise later. And it will seem like this new problem, the demise, arrived from outside the system, that suddenly this brick falls on me from the right, not realizing that all, ultimately the causal chain brought back to this original problem in the past. And this is kind of the closing the loop here, the feedback systems approach is what we're kind of uh, talking about in this chapter. And I like this example, uh, this capacity expansion example, um, which is a real world example where Moorcroft's firm was brought in to, um, to discuss the, uh, what seemed to be the never ending problem of road congestion in London. And they started to diagram out all of the causal forces that they could think of that influence people's behavior, whether they take public transit, whether they drive a car, when do they drive a car more and so on and so forth. And they, you know, initially you focus on these, the open loop perspective is just kind of where decision makers were before this, uh, before taking this kind of systems approach. And they said, well, you know, we, we, re we get pressure to reduce congestion from our voters, from our citizens, from our policymakers, from our stakeholders. 
And so our natural response is to build more roads. And that takes time to build more roads. So there's a delay here. And so that eventually leads to increased highway capacity, which does decrease the travel time, which in theory will relieve the pressure to reduce congestion. So all we have to do is expand the roads and everything's gonna be fine forever. But that's kind of a short-sighted way to view it. It is true that you're thinking of a whole loop, but you're not thinking of all the side effects of building these new roads and decreasing this travel time. And maybe the fundamental problems. You might be treating a symptom, but not the fundamental problem. So if we zoom out a little bit farther and include more variables in the boundary of our system, so we use this term boundary a lot, then oh, it looks like I, let's start PowerPoint once more. Two more. Right here. Let me get that share back up and running. Where did it go? Oh, it's up there. Okay, we're back up with the. Uh, so, okay, online, we can see the share good. All right, let me grab that up here and pull it away. Zoom tight. All right, so if we zoom out a little bit, so in our causal loop diagrams, we realize there's a bunch of variables that we didn't include. If we put them in there and start drawing the causal connections, we might notice there are other feedback loops that are affecting the dynamics here. So we say, well, what, else happens when you adjust travel time? Well, if travel time, um, that seems to have potentially a major, major causal effect on attractiveness of driving. So if you make travel time sh uh, shorter, so there's, you spend less time on the roads, then people are going to want to spend more time in their cars. The attractiveness of driving is going to go up. And so that means that there's another loop down here that we can say, okay, well, if the attractiveness of driving goes up, what's gonna happen? Well, the trips per day, that'll go up. If the trips per day goes up, the traffic volume is gonna go up. And then that ultimately is gonna increase the travel time. And so we get another balancing loop down here. And so that's something that's often forgotten, this, this loop here. And if we, we look at these two balancing loops, then this should remind us of something that we've been seeing over and over again. It's this so-called escalation archetype. We've got two balancing loops that are fighting to do the opposite thing of a stabilized quantity travel time. So travel time is always staying roughly the same. It has temporary diversions. It might get a little better, it might get a little worse, but over time, it pretty much stays the same. Meanwhile, you're constantly building new roads and you're constantly, um, and you're seeing more and more cars filling those roads. So it's just like having the flow of water going into the bucket. You have a constant inflow of water and a constant leakage of water. It's one way to kind of look at it here. So two balancing loops, which you would think would bring things back down to a balance. I mean, they do bring this into balance. Couple to kind of have this figure eight effect where road construction, if you were to follow the figure eight all the way around, you actually get an even number of negative links. So it's like road construction really has a positive effect on itself. And it's like trips per day has a positive effect on itself. So we just keep driving those things. So um, adding this loop up top is not going to actually fix the problem. Moreover, um, so this is at the escalation. So when we look ahead to, uh, to next week's unit, unit C, then we'll start, we'll actually read, the next reading assignment is to read about a lot of these different archetypes. And this is one of the common archetypes here. So we're going to learn to recognize these archetypes. But if we zoom out even further, we find out that this little balancing loop down here, there's a bunch of other balancing loops going in the same direction. So this system has so, uh, like the, the bottom of this is, is so strong that it's gonna be um, impossible to just build a capacity expansion loop, especially with this delay up here. It's, it's so slow to increase capacity that you're never gonna keep up with the relatively quick forces down here. And things that 
you would like to encourage, like public transit, there's actually a delay there. So you would like to maybe kick off this loop down here where increasing public transit, but, and you would think as a, the attractiveness of driving goes down, that should get people to ride more public transit, but it takes so long for people to adjust their behaviors that this bottom loop doesn't actually kick in and, um, and take over that much. So you don't really get that much of a shift to public transit. So in reality, you end up getting most of uh, the people just um, end up staying in their cars for so long that the road construction makes things a little bit better. And then they end up you know, not wanting to take public transit. So these kind of delays end up compounding the problem. And in the end, unless you could like immediately make more roads and never you know, run out of space, then this is never gonna work. So if you really want travel time to be shortened, the only way you're gonna do that is by getting rid of this delay and just allowing road construction to take over the planet. And that's obviously not sustainable. So that means that as, you know, as decision makers in this system, we need to find a way to focus our efforts, not on the top loop, because the top loop really is a short-term symptomatic fix how do we get the, the bottom one better here? So, you know, can we um, change the public transit fare? Maybe that's gonna help. Um, can we, um, this adequacy of public transit, can we make uh, buses and trains cleaner, uh, more attractive, faster? Um, those are things that if we really put our investment here, then we aren't going to just keep growing roads. We might actually have a chance of alleviating the travel time without kind of paving the planet. So, and that's the perspective we get by zooming out. And that's kind of this, this example here. Now, of course, I'm not saying it's easy to do this stuff. I mean, there, this, we, what I have, I could zoom out further and I could say, well, how the heck do you do these things? Well, that might mean getting voters on board. That might mean um, levying taxes. You know, these sorts of things that might be totally impossible. So, um, so it's certainly not trivial, but, it's kind of like the fish example where we said, once we zoomed out enough, then we sort said that if we had these cunning fish, which we could maybe implement with quotas, then maybe that would be a more sustainable solution for the fishery. And that was something that we could actually chase that target. And we, it, you know, it actually could theoretically work. This up here is the easy solution. And if we, we can chase that, we know how to do that, but ultimately, we're just resigning ourselves to having roads that just grow and grow and grow and travel time that doesn't actually change that much over the long haul. So that's kind of the lesson here of zooming out to get a better perspective of what's really going on. So that's feedback systems thinking. And so um, back in the nineties, this became sort of popular. There's this book that came out uh, by Peter Senge. And unfortunately there's gonna be a lot of like old white males um, in this. And it's, so my, my background is actually, so uh, I did dynamical systems modeling um, when I was younger, but I actually didn't learn it from the system dynamics modeling community. So Jay Forrester was not somebody who was familiar to me. There's a lot of other people that work in effectively the same thing, but just live in kind of a different academic silo. So later in my career, I became familiar with this stuff and it was easy to pick up. It was all the same stuff I'd learned before. For whatever reason, this system dynamics modeling, which is tends to be the kind of academic silo that's most associated with sustainability and management is dominated by these old white men. Um, but so I don't wanna give the impression that's what it looks like nowadays, but historically these happen to be the founders of this little academic subdiscipline. So I just wanted to put that little caveat there that I wasn't trying to imply that this is what the field now looks like. It's just unfortunately the history of the field is filled with not a very diverse group of people. Um, so Peter Senge wrote this big book, in the 90s, Shift of Mind, and, um, and Shift of Mind popularized this way of thinking, and it brought this academic perspective from Forrester kind of more into the public. And so the shift here was this idea that if we, we, can, we naturally want to focus on this simple feedback loop in the middle, um, where we only consider the discrepancy, our uh, decision, our actions, and then fixing that discrepancy, but the shift is we really need to consider the side effects because those side effects can actually compete with 
the intended action and then end up upsetting this here. So if we don't shift our perspective to considering the whole picture, then we're losing out. And so that's kind of the systems thinking perspective is to think about the side effects of our actions, not just the actions themselves. All right, so any questions about this basic idea or concerns or um, maybe disagreements? Make sense? All right, well, let's uh, do a mid-class attendance exercise. Haven't done that in a little while. So I'll put the link in the chat. And if you, you're also free, of course, to submit this on paper after class, or if you're in class or online, you can do this after the class, because again, I leave this up for at least 24 hours. So the um, question I'm gonna ask is that um, capacity expansion loop for, or that, that um, figure eight for the road system, I keep mentioning that it's an example of one of these common system archetypes. What is that archetype name that we give to that figure eight where it's two balancing loops with a stable quantity in between? So uh, again, this is a graded for completion, not uh, correctness. So if you don't quite remember, that's fine. Just give me your best guess as to what that, the name of that figure eight archetype was. The, the question was that, um, that road diagram that had the figure eight with the capacity expansion on top and kind of all the other factors on the bottom, that in itself, I said, when you have two balancing loops with a stable quantity in the middle, there's a, an archetype that we call that, like a name for that pattern. What's the name that we give that? Okay, and I guess I can put that question in the chat too. Um, and it's just, what is the name for the archetype pattern of the figure eight with two balancing loops connected by a stable quantity? Graded for completion, not correctness. And as a hint, I'm not looking for positive or negative or balancing or reinforcing. I'm looking for that higher order um, term that has to do with when you put two feedback loops together or multiple feedback loops together. Just getting us kind of warmed up for unit C where we talk about these higher order structures. All right. So that takes us in the chapter to CLDs. Again, hopefully this is all review at this point. Um, so, uh, but this is just kind of Moorcroft's take on it. And so uh, Moorcroft uses the, the hunger example, which we've talked about before. Um, and, you know, so this is all stuff that we've seen before. And just emphasizing that you choose these labels on the links based on kind of a no change baseline. And so the idea there is, Imagine a scenario uh, where we did not increase amount eaten or hunger and think about however large hunger and amount eaten would be in that static scenario. And now imagine the hypothetical case where you got hungry or the hypothetical case where you ate more food. And relative to where hunger and amount eaten would be, if you hadn't made that change, what happens? And so if we increase our amount eaten, Relative to the situation where we didn't increase our amount eaten, our hunger would decrease because those moved in opposite directions. We got a minus. On the top end, if we increased our hunger relative to our hunger staying the same, then um, we would probably then, uh, in hunger control, increase the amount we're going to eat. And so that's why it's a plus because it moves in the same direction. So, um, and then because this has one negative loop or one negative link, this is a negative feedback, which were Moorcroft labels with a B. And what does B stand for? Balancing. Balancing, that's right. So the um, so Moorcroft just uses the terms balancing and reinforcing instead of positive, or instead of negative and positive. They mean the same thing. Um, if you want to label yours with a plus there, if you're ever drawing one of these, or sorry, a minus there, if you want to draw one of these, that's, that's fine with me too. All right, so any questions about the the links and things like that. I mean, this is again just review of what we've done before. Everybody feel confident that this is a minus and that's a plus. Great. All right. And then the other thing we want to focus on is that we want to make sure that we're not linking things up because they're correlated. We link them up because we know or hypothetically we hypothesize there's a causal link between them. So there may be a common cause 
for two things that are related. But um, so this was like the sunlight example. If it gets hot outside, then there may be a, uh, there, there may be a common movement in sunburn and ice cream consumption. But sunburn and ice cream consumption do not have a causal link between them. So just because they're correlated doesn't mean it's enough for us to draw a link. It may be the case that whenever sunburn goes up, um, you know, there would be an effect with, you know, ice cream consumption that's always going to seem to track it. But the only reason they track each other is because of that common cause. So we don't want to draw links unless there's a causal a connection, or unless we hypothesize a causal connection. You might say that there is a connection between ice cream consumption and sunburn, but then you have to justify to me, the stakeholder, why the heck would you draw that link there? And you'd say, oh, well, I read a paper and it said that when people eat more ice cream, it makes them more prone, their skin changes, and you have to give me that story. So we justify the links with background information. And then once the links are up there, we analyze what we get. So this is where our hypotheses really live is in the links. Questions about that? Is this pretty clear what I mean by the cause and effect? Okay. All right, and then uh, other tips um, here. So um, this is, so if you took, you get an old white guy um, in the business community, um, he sort of has the leading textbook on this field, the system dynamics modeling field. So if you go to school at a, uh, you know, like MIT, it was, it was B school or UPenn or whatever, you use the giant tome of the textbook from Sturman, which covers a lot of the same things that our Moorcroft textbook does. And his tools are, his, uh, you know, rules are in CLDs, you always use curved lines. So even though by default, they're a straight line and Vince them, you use curved lines, especially when they're participating in a feedback loop, because the whole point is to draw the reader's attention to the loops if they exist. Um, and so you want to try to make those curved things follow circular oval paths to make those loops jump out when you back up and look at from a kind of a mile high view down. Uh, then uh, you want to minimize crossed lines. So it's okay to make loops that go way out as long if they avoid those cross lines, because again, you want to try to make the loops jump out at you. You don't want to sort of make um, faux loops as things cross and they kind of make it look like there's a loop when there's not actually a loop. Um, then this is, you know, eliminate chart junk. So don't put boxes around your variable names on causal loop diagrams, just words, words and lines. It's all you have there. And as you draw, um, redraw. And so this is why a computer-aided tool is great for causal loop diagrams because it's much easier to redraw. And even tools like VinSim, if you drill down into the kind of tools inside VinSim, it can try to redraw for you. So you can put a bunch of stuff in there and you can say, VinSim, try to make this prettier and it'll move things around and try to redraw it. Sometimes it does a good job. Sometimes it does a terrible job. Unfortunately, you can undo, um, but um, at least something, you know, it, it gives you, it, it can save you work, you moving everything around. So that's kind of the general graphical. This is not anything, I'm not gonna grade you on, your your graphical way but uh to um to draw these diagrams but these are the kind of the conventions that most people follow and i think you'll find that it'll just become natural for you to follow these conventions yourself as you draw these things um the other thing this is a little more important um Moorcroft talks about picking variable names and we talked about this a little bit last time i know in the muddiest points people said this is kind of a confusing thing um each variable must be a noun or a noun phrase um, so adjectives can be added to simple nouns, again, noun phrase, but try to avoid at verbs. So temperatures rise, get rid of the rise or directional adjectives. So um, by directional adjectives, we don't want to say increasing temperatures. Technically, increasing temperatures is a noun phrase, but it puts direction into the phrase. We really want the direction to be in the link or in the arrow. So avoid that increasing, just say temperatures. Um, and then words should apply measurability. And so this is a tricky one. Um, so you're going to have cases where there really will be no scale. Like you can't look up and say, what are the units of morale? Or, you know, I, it's not like there's a, a you know, British thermal unit of morale or something like that. Um, but in theory, you could order things. So I could say, who has better morale? And I could have you line up on a wall. Like, who is a, 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 um, a better um, uh, satisfaction? Who's more satisfied 
with their delivery, you know, with, with Uber Eats or whatever. So, you, you know, you use Uber Eats to order food. Some of you love it. Some of you hate it. And so in theory, I could say, how satisfied are you with Uber Eats? And, um, and you could give me a number and I could sort you by that number. Or I could say at a hospital, how much pain are you in? Here's a pain scale. And I could, in theory, sort you by that. So when I say measurability, what I really kind of mean is sortability. Is it possible to sort things um, according to this measure? And so with that, we can put up a couple of examples here. So these are examples, I think, from the reading assessment as well. So if we look at these, we can sort of pick out variables that are probably good, probably bad, and maybe just not descriptive enough, but you know, um, but aren't obviously really super bad. So um, does anybody want to give me an example of, of some of these that are definitely bad? Online would be fine too. Hand in the back. All right, so the first one here is increase in cost. I like that because uh, increase, it's technically a noun phrase, you know, it's an increase in cost. It's technically even measurable. We can measure how much it increases, but um, the increase is kind of a directional. So it'd say, well, can we simplify it? We can simplify it by just saying cost. So that one I'd say is bad. Anybody else? What's a bad, yeah, the green? Interesting. So, um, so experienced staff is, um, you, you could, I think staff experience would be a perfectly reasonable variable that's up there. And so, um, so I would be happy with staff experience. Personally, I'm also okay with experienced staff because it experience sounds a little bit like a directional word. So some of this is really subjective and I get that. And I, I apologize for, for that. You know, it's kind of, you know, it when you see it, but I, it, it does seem useful. Like you could imagine what happens if I take the directional word off um, and it's just staff. Well, I don't, I can imagine not just wanting an increase in staff. I want to say an increase in what type of staff my experienced staff, because I can hire anybody off the street or I can hire people that actually have in their resume some background. And then that gives me my experienced staff. So it seems useful for me to have experienced staff. Whereas increasing cost, the increase in, I know that I can get rid of that and I can put the increase in into the link. I can't put experienced into the link. So I like staff experience. I could be another one that's up here. I also like experienced staff. Does that make sense? Anything else? Any other targets we want to take down off this list? Yeah. Increasing prices, same sort of deal here. So increasing prices, got that directional word, same thing with increasing costs. Yeah. Delivery performance. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great, so why do you say delivery performance? Yeah, okay, I like that. So this is also one that I would knock out myself. So I agree with you. And I would say delivery performance, it's one of these things where it's kind of like, it's not descriptive enough um, in like the same way staff would not be descriptive enough. So I'm saying, well, what does it mean um, for there to be, like we could say, well, an increase in delivery and performance would mean, you know, that that's maybe their the performance got better. But let's be a little bit more specific about what we mean. And we mean like, oh, maybe they're, the time it took for them to get to my house, you know, the speed, you know, maybe how delicate they were, uh, their failure rate, you know, that sort of thing. Let's drill down and say, what is actually the measure of performance? And just put that there. Because those different measures might, there might be different effects. Like if I um, think about Amazon workers, you know, and all the pressures put on them, you know, if you try to increase one measure of performance, as they deliver things to your house, you might actually hurt other measures of performance. And they're all bundled under performance, but they don't necessarily move in the same direction. That's why we need to drill down. Any other comments about these ones up here? And online, you're happy to, if you have any as well, I can take a look at the chat or you can unmute. We got most of the really bad ones, but there's maybe one or two that I would also say could be improved. Yeah. Attitude. So yeah, so that's one that, um, that uh, yeah, I also think that I would target. Yeah, it's a good, that, that's because we don't know what, you know, saying someone has an increase in attitude, increase sounds positive, but the term attitude kind of sounds negative. So let's just be more specific, like morale. 
Okay. Well, here's here's the kind of the way I grouped them. Um, like I said, we can debate about some of these things, but um, but I think basically we came down into the same sort of ways that I, I kind of uh, I kind of figured. Um, these I think are probably good. These I think are descriptive enough. They're not violating our rules. Um, these ones we've talked about all the reasons why these up here are probably bad. Um, water, I probably would flag because um, what does it mean to have an increase in water? You know, it feels like we, it wouldn't hurt us to be a little more specific, like water level, that would be good. Um, you know, something it, it, like it, something more application specific. So water to me just seems a little too generic. So, okay. So any questions or complaints about this one? Any doubts, disagreements? Okay, good. All right, other um, things that we talked about in this chapter. So um, if you do have trouble figuring out the variables, Gesundheit, um, this goes along with a sort ability or the measurability. Uh, Moorcroft says define the units. And, um, and so he puts in little curly braces underneath each one of these, the potential units for these different um, variables. And being able to define the units helps provide us some justification that this is maybe a good variable to use up there. Because if we want to move to the quantitative step, then this suggests that there's actually maybe a way to quantify this thing. So I think it's a great heuristic is to try to define the units. So marketing budget, pounds per month, sales, units per month. You know, customers interested. Well, that's in units of customers. That's pretty easy. Something like industry reputation is a little trickier. How do you define a unit for rep your reputation? Well, if you think about it, you could say, well, there's a lot of things that go into reputation. So if we're in a, a marketing uh, uh, you know, school, then what they would do is they'd say, let's take all the things that go into someone's reputation and we'll build a so-called index of it. And it might be that it's you know, your size, the amount of advertising, whatever. There's all these things that are kind of added together with different scales in front of them that form a so-called an index here. And that, um, and that just gets normalized and so it's on a scale of zero to one. So you gotta have to imagine a hypothetical index. You could, in theory, build some index of reputation that just adds together a bunch of things that are measurable out there. Um, you know, things like bidding power of new competition, that seems like a weird one, but if you kind of think about it, like, well, I could actually measure the bidding power. Like, how often do they win bids? If they win a lot of bids, they have a lot of bidding power. They're doing really well. So that's something I could measure. Um, and then again, the reputation here. So um, adding units is a good step to figuring out that you've got a good variable. Any questions on this? That makes sense, the adding units. I think, yeah. You could create your own, absolutely. So um, I think Moorcroft just put the zero to one here to suggest that um, you know it's a nice positive scale where zero maybe has a concrete meaning, one has a concrete meaning, and so it's easy to define to our stakeholders. But absolutely, if it's more convenient for you to do some other scale, negative one to one, negative 100 to whatever, that's fine. But in, it's just a theoretical unit you could put on. All right. Any other questions or qualms about, about this? Again, for me, um, I, I focus more on, can I sort it? Is it sortable? That's more important to me than it's measurable, but I think that's me and Moorcroft saying the same thing with different words. Okay. All right, I don't know if you know, on my question slides, I like to use this, um, this S-shaped growth kind of motif here. where We've got the growth loop. And, um, and the negative feedback loop here, the limitation uh, portion. I do that because there's been studies that show that you have to kill about 30 seconds for, uh, on average, for the first question to pop up in a classroom. So, and then, um, and then once you, uh, you know, get that first question, then a bunch of other questions will pop up, but then gradually you answer all the questions and they level off. So questions actually grow in kind of an S-shaped growth curve and so um, because of that, they tell us we're supposed to kill about 30 seconds of dead air. And that's just what I did. 
So, um, so that's the reason why I've got this little S-shaped growth curve. So if you ever have a question when I move on, please interrupt me because I probably just didn't take my adequate 30 seconds. Okay. So where do we go next? So we built, um, so in the chapter it said, you've identified causes. That's great. That's the systems thinking perspective. That's SOS 220 level stuff. Uh, but now that we have theoretical networks of causes, um, then we can test those things out by actually building simulations that tell us the behavior over time. And that's what we start seeing towards the back end of this chapter. And so we've seen lots of behavior over time to curves in the last two or three years of this pandemic. Um, you know, so this is one example for a while, people were publicizing the so-called reproduction rate of, um, of the virus. And um, so you could watch, um, you know, it was high and then it came down low and it bounced up. And a lot of times be these behavior over time graphs, BOTGs as they're sometimes called, then they would add these little uh, labels, which you might not be able to see here um, unless you're right up next to this, but it says like shelter started at one point, reopening at another point, shelter ended. And so people look at these behavior over time graphs and real data and they form theories of the underlying processes. They're like, ah, I see that um, this reproductive rate uh, was going down. Uh, they started sheltering, then they reopened, and then it started going back up. And um, and so um, they, you know, so people start forming causal hypotheses by looking at these behavior over time graphs. And so we want to build simulations that build these that look at these behavior over time graphs to see if that those causal hypotheses actually generate. The behaviors that people see like so if i build a sim that's all based on shelter then is it the case that sheltering and reopening is enough to cause these little patterns here like this uptick um, in the reproduction rate of the virus and if it's not then maybe shelter wasn't it if it is then maybe i do a, a support for that hypothesis and you can find uh, so this is an article that from 2018 um so before the pandemic, using behavior over time graphs, BOTGs, or just BOTs, um, to spur systems thinking among public, public health practitioners. And this is a BOTG uh, that came out of this paper where they have plotted um, at a larger time scale from 1900 um, up to um, the year 2000, the annual per capita cigarette consumption. And so you can watch how cigarettes go up and you notice that they add these little darts um, in these, these big events, like the Great Depression is at this corner and then it comes down. So there, these little darts explaining these kinks in the behavior over time graph are effectively causal hypotheses. And so this is our first step. You take a behavior over time graph and that helps us form causal hypotheses. And then we can load into a sim the test to see if, um, if really, um, the Great Depression, if we simulate the Great Depression, is that enough to cause cigarette sales to do this? If so, we've gained a new insight into how the system works. If not, then we reject that hypothesis and we look for another explanation for this little downtick. And that might just be, that's taking the endogenous perspective. The exogenous perspective is it's just random. And it, it was just coincidental with the Great Depression. So that's what I mean by behavior over time graphs, trajectories of measures over time. And so um, they talk about in this article how public health practitioners can use BOTs, behavior of time graphs, to spur discussion and systems thinking around complex challenges. And so drawing these graphs, annotating the events, like the inf um, what events that are likely to influence the trends, and then discussing the graphs in diverse groups. So again, combining mental models provides an opportunity for public health practitioners um, to create a more holistic understanding of key factors that contribute to a trend. And so they talk, they're kind of advocating for using behavior over time graphs alone, even without simulation in public health professions. So that's what we mean by behavior over time. And you can find a bunch of other articles. Um, so this is BOTs applied to uh, healthy eating and active living environments. Um, so again, they, um, this is kind of a similar message here, again, in the public health uh, discourse here. So. Well, so we can look at behavior over time graphs in real data, then we can also generate hypothetical behavior over time graphs. We assert a causal hypothesis, we build, and we're going to, we're learning how to build a simulation, we run on the simulation, and our causal hypothesis plays out, 
over a, um, a simulated world. And then we compare the behavior of a time graph in our simulated world to the real world to evaluate if we got the causal uh, links correct. It's kind of what we're doing here. So this is, um, this here is just a standard balancing loop with delay. And based on the magnitude of delay, you get different behaviors over time. And so if someone gets into a shower, uh, they might think they're gonna jump in that shower and the common, um, the ideal condition would be the water temperature would rise right up to their uh, ideal level very quickly. Um, mo the common sense solution is you're gonna get in there and it's gonna take a little bit of a little while, the water's gonna be cold, but eventually it's gonna hit your target temperature. That's the common sense down here. But the most likely case is you go in, it's cold, you over adjust, it becomes too hot, you under, you over adjust again, becomes too cold and so on. And eventually over a long period of time, it settles out. And these, it, you can turn out that you can get all three of these trajectories by simulating this comfort seeking loop by changing the amount of delay that you have. here. And in systems uh, engineering, we refer to these three cases as being Underdamped, that's the oscillating, you, know, you don't have to memorize these terms. I'm just saying that we do have terms for these. Underdamped, that's the one that is oscillating. Overdamped, that's the really slow common sense one. And critically damped, that's the ideal case one. And so um, depending on, so this is showing that there are really true quantitative differences in behavior over time graphs, which is why simulation is so important. It's not enough just to have the causal loop diagram. So that's what we're kind of moving into here is these behavior over time. And so any, um, any one of these balancing loops with delay is going to have a behavior over time, which is gonna look like one of these three curves. At least that's if this is all that's going on in the system. Okay. So, um, so then we can say though, uh, once we've formed this hypothesis, the systems thinking approach is to say, are we leaving anything out? Is really our system just as simple as this? And if so, then these are all the only behavior over time graphs that we should expect out of our system. Now we might find that our real system has a behavior over time, which doesn't look at all like this. It might oscillate forever and never settle down. Or the oscillations might actually grow. They get worse and worse and worse and worse. If that's the case, and that suggests we're leaving something out, that this hypothesis is rejected and we need to augment the hypothesis to figure out what's actually going on. And this might be that maybe we're talking about a shower in a hotel and that shower is coupled with other showers. Or maybe you've talked about uh, even in a single house, you've got a guest room shower or the kids room shower and the master shower. And so if you have two showers going on here and they share a common flow of water, then you get something which looks a little bit like a balancing loop with delay, but this is what's called the accidental adversaries uh, archetype here, where you've got two balancing loops that are coupled by a reinforcing loop that represents this kind of shared resource. And it's a reinforcing loop and that's the adversary. It's sort of, um, uh, it's like a tit for tat battle is that as the, um, you, you pull hot water away from here, they're gonna request hot water, which is gonna cause them to pull more hot water away from you. And this more, more, more is what generates this adversarial effect where it's kind of a back and forth. And so if we add these two things, which is just one shower and another shower with a system coupled in between them, then we can get more interesting behaviors over time like this one. So that system you can take and simulate it. I actually had an honor student build that system and simulate it for her honors thesis project for this, uh, for her honors contract for this prod, for this course. And this is not, this isn't her output, but this is the output the, um, from Moorcroft simulation. And the dark line here is the temperature at one shower and the blue line, the thin blue line is the temperature at the other shower. And like we see, we get a behavior over time that doesn't look at all like a standard balancing loop with delay. It actually has these oscillations which seem to grow over time. And so um, this shows that when you have, um, that we're actually combining aspects of escalation behavior and balancing with delay. So if I go back and look at that 
together, I've got two balancing loops coupled with a single quantity that feels like escalation behavior, but the quantity in the middle isn't stabilizing. It itself is a reinforcing loop that can grow. So I kind of combine those things together and I get a much richer um, system that kind of looks like both, but is distinct. I mean, this is its own special thing here where we get escalating oscillations. And that, so, so when we have, so we can use this two ways. If we see escalating oscillations in a real system, that gives us a hint that this might be the causal structure that's underlying this. The other way around, if we happen to build a system and notice that we have this, before we implement that system or you know, test that system, we might predict ahead of time that we're gonna have this problem and we'll need to work uh, on uh, preventing it. And so how do we work on preventing it? Well, the shower case, I might wanna make sure there's a huge pot of hot water available, like a giant water a heater, so that I minimize this interaction between here, so that both of these can operate like independent comfort seeking loops. That might be one thing that I need to do, and uh, and so on and so forth. So there, so that's before I kind of generalize this, uh, like Moorcroft did. Um, are there are there questions about this? Does this kind of make sense? How I started with a balancing loop with delay. It had one behavior over time, and then I said, but. You know, in reality, we're not seeing that. What's going on? And then I zoomed out systems thinking, realized there's another shower in the system and they're coupled. And then to test that theory, I then built a simulation with two showers coupled with this resource, generated a behavior over time from that simulated system. And it looks a lot more like our real system, which suggests now I know what's happening. These two showers are fighting for hot water. And what I really should do is I maybe, you know, upgrade my water heater to um to prevent these or separate them and put them on separate water heaters so I get rid of that couple. Yeah. Um, why don't you start at time zero? Uh, well they do start at time zero and put a temperature to the bottom like you're turning it on, right? Yeah. The with the next uh right, right. So they you know we could have simulated this as them both starting at uh, zero. I think for um for technical reasons that has to do with the numerics of the simulation they decided to initialize both of them as if they started with, um, with, with this temperature here. It doesn't change really the effect of the, 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 much of the effect here. In fact, I think it emphasizes kind of an interesting thing is that, um, is that they even, so, so I think what they're trying to, what Moorcroft was doing when they built this sim is they wanted to really focus on the competition effects and not on the S-shaped growth effects. And so what they were saying here is, even if you already like had plenty of hot water in the system, you're still going to get this battle between them. If they both started cold and ramped up, then we'd have an e even more interesting transient because they both be kind of ramping up and then potentially be oscillating like this. And so he made a decision to choose an initial condition where we aren't focusing on that initial ramp up that we get an S-shaped growth. But you, know, you could start with the initial condition being at zero and then see what, what happens after this. But I think to really focus on the competition piece and not get kind of confused in the confounding of these two effects next to each other, he says, we're just gonna load the system up with hot water first and then see what happens once it's loaded up. Any other questions, questions online? This flow makes sense to you. Great. All right, so that's the accidental adversaries archetype. It's a, an archetype that actually goes beyond the archetypes that we'll talk about in the document, the, the unit C document, but it's just one I'm throwing in there as a bonus since Moorcroft uh, mentioned it. Now, this archetype doesn't only apply to showers, like this cute little pig over here, um, but, uh, but as Moorcroft points out, um, in, from an example from his own consulting work, it also applies to the uh, construction of motorcycles and motorcycle parts. And so he was asked to, it would be employed to analyze the system dynamics at one of Harley Davidson's uh, plants. And what he found was that they have two sectors, a sector for motorcycle, motorcycle production and a sector for parts production. So um, orders come in for both. So people come in and they want to buy whole motorcycles. They also want to buy parts for motorcycles. Now, these two um, parts of the company are linked 
by a single area of ca uh, capacity management and allocation. In other words, all the money is, there's a single pot of money that sources the needs for both sections of uh, the company and uh, money and resources and so on. And so orders come in and resources go out and then hopefully shipments go out. And so, but you can't make the shipments in the motorcycle production until you get the cash to build the motorcycle. So when orders come in, they go all the way into the capacity management. They allocate then money and resources to the motorcycle production and then motorcycles go out. Similarly, when parts come in, the parts just don't magically appear. Those orders go in, they allocate money to parts production and then those parts go out. So um, what ends up happening is that you end up getting, if you've got a lot of motorcycle production, they end up draining all of the resources from here. There's no resources left over for parts production. And so the lead time on parts increases because people wait, are waiting on their parts to get built because they don't have, they have to wait on the money to trickle in in order for them to have enough money to build those parts. And the same thing can happen on the other side of that as well. So the point here is that these two apparently independent subsections of the company share a single resource. And share is our kind of dynamical systems word for compete. And so they really are competing for finite resources. And the competition for finite resources is going to lead to these kind of tit for tat battles where uh, the consequences are this, you're gonna get huge delays in parts, huge delays in motorcycles and so on. I think we all understand this more and more now because supply chains are becoming so much more focal in today's world. So we know that it seems almost random that you can't buy toilet paper and then you can't buy rice or something like that. Oh, that would be terrible. But there'd be, you know, there's a bunch of different, it seems like it's totally just a roulette wheel where the lead time is. You don't ever know if you're going to be able to get something the next day or the next month or the next year. And it's due to a lot of this right here, where the shared resource sometimes is just as simple as having people to stock things. And so many people are out because they're sick or they decided to leave the industry and so on and so forth, that it's like having that water heater that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think we're all kind of more familiar with these dynamics. And, um, and Moorcroft's kind of point was that this, this, this system is really no different than the shower system. So, if we really understand how these escalating oscillations happen in the shower system, then really we can use that as a model to enhance our mental models to immediately understand the liabilities and the threats that can occur inside other coupled systems like the motorcycle system or our coupled supply chains now. So, um, so it seems silly, like why are we studying showers? We study showers because we know how to model showers very easily. They're very tractable model systems. And we don't always anticipate the real problems are gonna be out there. But when we do have a real problem like this one, when we recognize that it has all the same elements of this little toy model that we built, this shower system up here. And now that we've understand Gesundheit, these shower, the shower systems here, we don't have to rebuild a model sort of bespoke to uh, this application area because we've already done it. We just named the variables so that they're fit for the shower. So in the shower system, you get a bigger water heater. In the motorcycle system, sorry, you gotta either decouple these things or you're gonna need to invest more in capacity here because you just don't have the capacity and that's why you're getting the oscillations here. Likewise, in our supply chain lead times in our current situation, you just need more workers. You know, you need um, you know, more, um, more inventory um, because we can't buffer against these changes. And so we can learn a lot just by studying showers. All right, so are there questions about that, I, any of that? Is that what the kind of takeaway you got from Moorcroft's investigation of these things too? Or disagreements or anything? Okay. So I've mentioned the um, escalation a lot. And I mentioned this accidental adversaries. This is a, a nice one that kind of combines um, escalation behavior um, with this balancing with delay. And so um, in this next unit that we're going into, unit C, 
Um, we're not going to read a chapter out of Moorcroft. We're going to take a break on Moorcroft for a unit. And we're going to instead read Applying System Archetypes, which is a PDF that you can get um, off Canvas. And um, it's also on perusal. And it's a, it's a short um, little document written by Kim and Lannon, um, where it talks about kind of the, the very common patterns that you see. And what's nice is they've already done the sort of the simulation work to tell you the common behavior over time that correspond to each one of these patterns. So in theory, you could sort of build up a vocabulary for these patterns where you know what behaviors they're associated with and then spot them. So you see the behaviors, you kind of immediately have a causal hypothesis, you see the causal structure, you immediately have a prediction for what the behaviors are gonna be and so on. And, um, and then if they aren't, then you can resort to simulation to enhance them even farther to sort of see how do they diverge from these types of things. So that's kind of what we're doing next unit here. So the other announcements I have here, um, just assignment B2, that's drawing causal loop diagrams in VinSim. Um, for those of you who are either using dark mode, um, I put some tips online on how to deal with uh, making um, uh, with, with VinSim and dark mode on your computers. For those where VinSim is crashing a lot, I put some tips online about how to switch to the old interface inside VinSim, which tends to be a little more stable. It's worked at least for a couple students. Um, so look at the announcements or the VinSim installation page on Canvas for that. There's also the muddiest point assignment due on Sunday. And um, there on Tuesday, when we start unit C, there'll be a new assignment, assignment C1, um, which involves some drawing and some things like that. Uh, but it's already on Canvas if you'd like to get started at that. So you know, feel free. So with that, that um, is all I've got for you today. So let's do an attendance exercise. And if there's any last minute questions, I'm happy to take them, but let's get this out of the way first. And so um, the question I have here is earlier, I asked about the archetype of the figure eight. And let's see if you can remember, uh, what is the name of the uh, systems archetype? Uh, so the pattern of the um, dueling shower system uh, with two balancing loops and a reinforcing loop in between. And um, as a hint, that's two words. And yeah, the question was, um, what is the name of the systems archetype? Um, so just like uh, before, well, yeah, what is the name of the systems archetype representing the dueling shower system? The one where I had the balancing feedback with the delay, the balancing feedback with the delay and the reinforcing loop in between. So that three loop system, what is the name that we called that archetype together? And this is graded for completion, not correctness. So we're, we're building up to the point where we recognize loops, patterns of loops have names. And so what is the name we give to that when there's two balancing loops of the reinforcing in between? And that's all I've got for you. So I think my next slide is just a question slide. So if you don't have any other questions, um, and feel free to take off. If you do have questions, I'm happy to take them online. If you've got questions, happy to take those as well. And have a good weekend. Uh -huh. So I think I'm all done, but like it's sometimes when I pinch a word, it just puts it off a little bit on certain. Does that matter, or do you want to redo it? Um, well, if it's obvious, like there, it's pretty obvious um, that it's not a big deal. Um, sometimes, if you like inside word if you kind of scale it a little bit there's a like render again okay. but um but just make sure i guess in vincent like you might just do like a a uh, like a control a in vincent to make yeah. sure you highlight it all and then copy that and paste in and all see right. if that fixes it or some like screenshots but too, and I was wondering if I could do yeah that's that. fine you can oh, just okay. use a screenshot that's fine okay yeah because on the directions it said like to copy but i don't know if you typically like oh no i mean it's just it's a little cleaner usually if you do the copy with Invincible. but if you want to take a screenshot and it's not all pixelated as long as it's readable i'm happy okay okay and this is like is like okay do you think for like one that we had to create. Um, yeah, I think for the second one, all I asked for is it's a simple balancing loop. Yeah. And so you kind of have gone, I think, even farther, but um, because you've, you've added the, the reinforcing loop. Yeah. But as long as you have, like, really, if you were just to have that, that, and that, and then got rid of all the rest of that, that would <laughs> that would meet it. Okay, sounds good. Okay. And let me just make sure it looks like nobody else. Oh, go ahead. Okay. But because I got a line of people there. So online, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Looks like most of you have trickled off anyway.